So we're here today with John Patrick McAfee uh, from New Mexico, a author who is here to talk about his books and his life experience. So you were first exposed to writing because your best friend's dad was the poet laureate of New Mexico. In your teenage years, you were shipped off to military school and you spent five years learning discipline and football. You graduated from high school and junior college there. With your ROTC commission, you entered the army as a second lieutenant. You attended the uh, infantry officer basic course, airborne school, special forces officer course and jungle warfare school. And you served with the Green Berets in Panama for the eighth special forces group and you served in Vietnam with the 5th Special Forces Group. And then returning from Vietnam, you completed your degree in English with a minor in Spanish. You moved to Asheville with your wife, uh, uh, artist Elizabeth McAfee. And you taught at several of the Buncombe County schools teaching English, drama, and wrestling. And you retired from teaching whenever a building was named uh, the Bryant McAfee Fine Arts Center. And that made you realize that when buildings are named for you, you it is time to retire. You currently live in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and you are writing. So tell us a little, what, what books are you writing? And um, then let's talk about the Parrot's Beak uh, location that you were on the border of Cambodia, I think, and Vietnam. Thank you, Davine. Uh, my book that I'm currently uh, have finished, it's my latest, it's called Stepping Over Bones. And it's about uh, the gullahs down in the low country of South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and to some extent, Florida. And I just wanted people to know their history, how rich and beautiful their history is. And uh, it was based upon me finding one time in a used bookstore, a book called Ain't I Got a Right to the Tree of Life. And it's a photographic exploration, if you will, of all the people that were, that, that were there from about the 50s all the way up to about the 70s. A lot of them have now died. But I was an A camp in an A camp near the Parrot's Beak in Vietnam. The Parrot's Beak is like an arthritic Florida that is jutting into Vietnam. I did not understand why that part of the topography was Cambodian because I don't remember ever passing over a river or anything like that to get into Cambodia. We were only about a quarter of a mile from Cambodia at night. You could see the trucks come in, uh, putting on their brake lights and you could hear them un unloading things in personnel usually to hit us, because we were right there in an infiltration route for them. But we were there to, I guess, to interdict any kind of troop movement or supply resupply movement uh, from the North Vietnamese army. And when I first got there, I was all excited about fighting the North Vietnamese because they were attacking the poor South Vietnamese and waging war on the populace. But what I soon came to realize, Devane, was that the North Vietnamese were led by a man by the name of Ho Chi Minh, who was their Abraham Lincoln. And as Abraham Lincoln, I, uh, I realized quickly that we were then in the middle of a civil war and I don't know if we were on the right side. I'm not saying the North Vietnamese were the right side, 
But I know the South Vietnamese weren't because they they were corrupt. They didn't like the Americans any more than the North Vietnamese did. And I could find things that I could not get from our resupply from the logistics officer at S4. I could find it on the black market if I needed boots for my men or if I needed clothes for my men. And I suppose I could have bought weapons, but I never tried to get that. But anything I needed as far as clothes, uh, resupply, any kind of resupply items, I could get on the black market quicker than I could get it from our own S4, which taught me that there was some kind of leak in the system. Also, when I went into uh, Cambodia, I saw that uh, the Cambodians, they were not fighting the North Vietnamese. They were letting them pass through, letting them come on into anywhere they could find an infiltration route into South Vietnam. Our reason for being there, I never did understand. After a while, I never did understand our reason. And then I was attending a lecture by uh, General Westmoreland at University of North Carolina, Asheville, when he told the audience, here is why we are, were in Vietnam. And that was for oil. He said, we found great deposits of oil off the Vietnamese shore. And so we were in there to try to get more oil. The irony is that in order to get out of Vietnam, we had to cede that oil, if you will, back to the North Vietnamese and by extension, the Chinese. And the Chinese were um, and are apparently pumping all that oil off the coast of South Vietnam. I have no idea where it's going in South Vietnam, but it is, uh, it is going to whoever's the highest bidder, I would think. So that was our incursion. That's the Parrot's Beak. And it was a, it's right there between three core and four core. Four core is a delta. And the delta is a place Imagine the deepest jungle of Florida. That's the delta. You get back in the bathtub to dry off. That's how I remember I would see sweat on my clothes that had white salt deposits on top of white salt deposits. I could knock them, I could knock the salt off uh, our fatigues. We wore tiger fatigues, so I cut all the sleeves off the tiger fatigues. And uh, I also had a tiger fatigue specially made with a lot of pockets in it. So I could put a, a lot of uh, M, M15, M16 cartridges in it so I could carry it whenever we go, went on missions. So if we got in a world of hurt, I could use that. Well, let me ask you something. It, that uh, Special Forces and Green Beret is such a highly specialized, most, probably the most highly trained. Why do you think that they put you on the border there uh, instead of a place where you could be, use your, those skills that, those very expensive skills to poss possibly better use? That's a wonderful question, Devane. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we were there to use uh, one, one aspect of Green Berets, they call us the quite professionals. And we don't brag, we don't go out and have a movie made of us, even though there've been a lot of movies of us, but we don't, we didn't do a lot of public relations. But what we did do was adapt and overcome whatever our mission was, we'd figure out a way to do it. Our main mission, as Green Berets were to foment guerrilla warfare and to foment 
a revolution in a country. That's the main mission of special forces. However, it got flipped on its head in Vietnam and since there was already a revolution going on and already guerrilla warfare, they figured we were the next people to understand how to fight guerrilla warfare because we had trained to, to be guerrillas and then we flipped over and did it the opposite direction. And to some extent it worked. Uh, I loved my A camp. I loved the men I served under. And to this day, I often think of them like, how did they, how are they doing? So uh, when you were there uh, in country, probably at the beginning of it, it was a huge challenge. Who did you depend upon to basically show you the ropes? My uh, non-commissioned officers from E7, E8s, to some extent E6s, but they had a lot of um, experience underneath their belt. Many of them were from Eastern Europe, had fought in Czechoslovakia, had fought in Hungary, had fought in Poland. Then they'd come over here. Uh, let me explain my, my advisor was a Captain Crichton, and he was with the Canadian Black Watch. And he got frustrated that there was a war going on that he couldn't compete in. So he resigned whatever rank he was in Canada, came down, went in as a private with special forces, worked his, himself up. He was a captain when I knew him, and later on I understand he was a major. And he uh, taught us everything we could at uh, special forces officer basic training. But I kind of got to be a cynic about the war. I will say this, that I, I didn't lose but one man from my A count. And I was proud of my record. I listened to my NCOs. As a young, dumb lieutenant and then a captain, they saved my life. Because these men were professionals. As a matter of fact, the name for Green Berets are the quiet professionals. And they go about their job. They are experts at it. They know what they're doing. They are not shock troops. They are thinking troops. So I think the good Lord put me with a, the right kind of people. I belonged with them because I couldn't stand straight legs. And those are people that don't jump out of airplanes. I couldn't stand the boringness of training and of uh, command stateside. I yearn, as a young man, naturally all of us do, young men, young women, we learn, yearn for adventure. Adventure. So we took off after, uh, after it, and it found us. <laughs> oh, yes, it found us. That adventure. Yeah, oh, yes, ma'am. It sure did. And there were times, there was one time when I was involved with a uh, firefight, and I remember hearing something shaking in the water behind me and I had no idea what that was and I turned around to look and it's my own foot shaking in the water that was my way of dealing with being under tremendous stress that I just things of me started shaking I, I don't want to talk too mad too much about it but you know I'm sure many combat veterans listening knows about almost peeing in your pants or peeing in your pants and it's hard to come down from a firefight. You had to really work at trying to find some rest. But if one stayed on for eight or nine hours, you didn't care if they were shooting. You, you'd get a little shut eye if you could because you knew it was going to come right back again. And it wasn't, you either, it was either sheer boredom in those A camps or sheer terror. There was no in between. Either it was a day by day existence or it was, we all got to pull together or none of us are going to survive. Uh, there was a camp, uh, a camp up in uh, two core or three core where uh, the guys on the, at the A camp is on the line to Natrang telling them that they're being overrun by tanks. And Natrang came back to them over the radio and said, that's a negative. Our intelligence shows there are no tanks. 
<laughs> and there's this pause on the radio, and then they hear this, all right, you blankety blanks, come up here. I'll let you interview the guy himself. He's parked on top of our A-camp. <laughs> so uh, sometimes what intelligence shows and what we knew were two different things. And uh, Vietnam was a, a learning experience and a learning curve, and it, it, it's affected me all the rest of my life. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, uh, you know, when the Pentagon Papers started coming out, and when you were there, you, you said, you know, it's not making sense here. What Did you come to any conclusion after some of the realities that were revealed in the Pentagon Papers uh, came, came into our awareness? General Westmoreland came to Asheville, to UNCA, and gave a talk, and my wife and I went. I sat right next to his wife, and uh, bef uh, before uh, he came out, his wife turned to me and she said, uh, uh, did you know him? And I said, yes, I used to work for him. <laughs> That's one of, what, 30,000 soldiers. Yes. So I told her, I used to work for him. She says, oh, okay, good. And so he started talking, and he gave me the answer gave me personally the answer to Vietnam. He said, we were in there because of oil. We knew that we had huge oil fields off the coast of Vietnam. And if we could get that country, we could get those oil fields. It did not turn out that way. We turned it over to uh, the North Vietnamese who also have developed the oil fields to some extent, and China, of course, controls it all as far as uh, getting the oil to flow and getting it to to distribute it to other countries or to whoever. So China controls all that now, in my opinion. That's very interesting because oil is a bane on our existence right up to now it's the common thread all the way through isn't it do you remember the main where they touted and by they uh our government touted that rare minerals had been discovered in afghanistan and to, to something like seven or eight times uh, known amounts and they were so excited about that and I thought back to what Westmoreland said about oil is why we went into Vietnam. And I thought maybe that's why we're trying to hang on for almost two generations in yeah. uh, Afghanistan. So. Well, you know, I, you know, I think I, that, that kind of makes sense when you also couple it with General Eisenhower's farewell speech where he said never before in the history of the world have we had a military industrial complex and basically he said that complex is going to have to be fed forever yep and so combining the need for fuel fossil fuel minerals and the need for those industries to continue to thrive makes more sense than anything else to me at this point in my understanding <laughs> and being a part of the generation that uh, our husbands went to Vietnam if we were wives or our authors here went to Vietnam. And we have so much, so much, um, we've had so much time to think about it through the years. Oh, yeah. My own son grew up before Afghanistan started and before it ended, he went over there and he was in military intelligence and he had his college degree, but he volunteered after 9-11 because he was so mad. And I don't blame him on that, but I warned him when something like this starts, it's a game inside of a game inside of a game and that there's concentric circles and getting to the bottom of the why of it all is like punching a fat man in the stomach. You never get to the bottom. And you being a uh, 
weightlifter and and a wrestling coach you totally understand <laughs> <laughs> what that what that comment that you just yeah. made means yeah when you fight when you fight a man that's got a lot of muscles you don't try to outmuscle him you got to wait till the oxygen starts till the muscles start demanding oxygen and then they get real tired because they got so much more mass to handle then you've got the trick is to last until they get tired uh-huh and i think that's why he, uh, there was two rules that they have instituted in Afghanistan that just made me ill. The first was, and my son was uh, privy to all this, was that if you knew that there were civilians in a house, even though they were firing upon you, as the soldiers had gotten in the house, you could not fire back. And the second thing was, that if you saw a group of individuals dressed as civilians, all with guns, walking down a trail at midnight, you could not open fire on them because they haven't made contact with you yet. And so what uh, the Taliban would do is they would put people on top of the house that were definitely civilians, mother, child, old men, and have them walk around the house, the roof of the house, so they could be seen from the air and from the soldiers that were being shot at, and they could not return fire. And the helicopters could not return fire. And when you have to ask someone's permission to open up on the enemy that's trying to kill you, those hesitations can cost lives. And... Um, I, I once uh, said, uh, I once heard a great, uh, he's in the Ranger Hall of Fame, I won't, uh, I won't use his name, but he was a great Ranger, a great Command Sergeant Major. And he once said that you cannot bring democracy to a Flintstone country. And that has stuck with me over the years. When so what did he mean by a Flintstone country? When the Vietnamese in the villages saw the first helicopters coming in with American soldiers, they thought they were dragons. They'd never seen a helicopter. They, they didn't have any context to imagine it. And so the villagers out there in their farms and their, their small hamlets they didn't know what it was. In Afghanistan, sometimes the people would stand on top of toilets because they did not know what toilets were and defecate that way. And they use a certain hand to wipe with and then they dipped it off water, but that's why they didn't shake with that certain hand. Oh. No. And uh, just like there were some mountain yards that believed that the soul of a child was located at the top of the head, so American GIs, or American Green Berets, our first instinct was to pat them on top of the head. That's what GIs do with small children. And uh, that offended them. Mm -hmm. So you got to learn quick other people's cultures and yes. other people's traditions. So... Um Given that early experience, and I'm, I know you that you had uh, a lot of uh, ongoing experience in teaching in, in the Buckland <laughs> County region, uh, why did you choose to write? And why did you get a, a degree in, in English? Well, it's the easiest degree because I was good at it. <laughs> well, that, well, so there. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm good at technology, so <laughs> there you go. A station is easy for me to handle the technology yeah. part. And Spanish, I, I spoke Spanish from the time I was uh, living on the ranch uh, all my life. Uh, it's Tex-Mex, but it's still Spanish. I can make myself understood and understand. And I would, uh, so that was easy to plug in. I, I, that was a uh, a free A, so to speak, in, in whether it was college or high school. And English, I've, I've always scored way high in that. With math, uh, more of a 
Luddite uh, with math. I, I couldn't no more. I love technology, but I don't know how to work it. And, and technology knows how to work me, trust me. Um, also, I wanted to write because I saw early in teaching and things like that, and I did drama, and I love drama. I love musicals. I love to do drama and musicals. Bill and Janice Bryant are my colleagues out at the Fine Arts Department out at A.C. Reynolds at the time, and they showed me the finer points of chorale and of music in band. Bill was the head of the, Dr. Bryant was head of the band, and Janice was head of the chorale, and uh, a lot of people don't know that she went to China with her chorale group, invited by the embassy in China to come sing for them. And they... <laughs> I know Janice is thinking about the same thing I am about. We had Bill down inside of this pit. And I won't say at what college we were playing at, but we had to do our musicals over there because we didn't have a place. And we placed Bill down inside this pit, and it was like, it, it was just like a, a, a little small, literally pit, and all the sound was bounced off Bill. And because we'd closed everything over except where you could see Bill conducting. And uh, we came in uh, the second I think it was the second time we're doing Fiddler on the Roof. And Bill came up to Janice and me and says, take that top off that pit. I'm going to go crazy down there, and those kids are going to go deaf. <laughs> and that was with five minutes left to go before the show. So here's Janice and I <laughs> taking this stuff off the pit. And, uh, and they were heavy. They were heavy tops. And uh, it was much better after that. But we had such adventures. And we were the first high school one of the first high schools in, I would say, in the South, to do Les Miserables, the high school version. And that was calculus. It took all my skills, all of Janice's skills, and all Bill's skills to, to carry it off. And it, it was just life-changing for me. Uh, for those kids to see what Victor Hugo had done, turn to music, and to have that emotion wash over them. I saw people change. I mean, for good. It was Victor Hugo and Charles Dickens were my favorite writers, as I would say as a young man. And I took everything they wrote to heart. And uh, Victor Hugo said, write two pages a day, seven days a week. And after that, you have... 56 pages in a month, 224 pages in four months, and you got the book pretty well done. He also said you quit writing in mid-sentence because you can't wait to get back to it. If you try to write more than two pages a day, you'll burn yourself out because the human mind and the human body are so focused when you're putting those words down. And this gets back to why did I want to write. It focused me. It helped me become more disciplined as a human being. And God knows I could use discipline because I, I grew. I, can't, can't we all? <laughs> no, not like, I, you got to understand, it was nothing for me, and my dad never asked. It was nothing for me to saddle a horse out on this 250,000-acre ranch and ride off and spend the night with my horse way out in the middle of nowhere. He never asked, never asked when we were coming. It was Huck Finn existence. I had an antelope for a pet, and that's a true story. Uh, his mother had gotten caught in a uh, barbed wire fence, and Daddy killed the mother because her, both her legs were broken, and you can't heal an antelope. But the little baby, he was going to kill that, and I said, Dad, don't do that. My dad was old, old school World War II veteran. And uh, I said, don't, let me raise it. And he said, by God, you raise it, it's yours, but, you know, I'd keep it out of the way. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I raise that little thing, and I pick up its little rabbit pellets of poop inside the house because that's where it insisted on sleeping in my bed because I, I guess I was its mother. I don't know what I was. But I gave it its little bottles of milk and just loved it to death. And i got to tell you this story real quick. Well, you don't have to hurry. Da okay, done. Daddy... Uh, grew chilies. He loved growing chilies. And he was so proud because we lived out in the desert. 
And he's so proud that his chili, chilies uh, were growing. And Governor discovered the flowers on top of the chilies. And uh, he Governor ate. Was, Governor was the antelope? Governor was the antelope. And he ate uh, the top of the chilies. And so uh, back in those days, when an when antelope reaches puberty, they got to hit something with their head. That's what young bucks of antelope bucks do. So we'd take our fist and hold it out and then let the antelope hit it. And we'd hold it and hold it, and we loved that. And all we had to do was stick our feet out, a uh, fist out, and there would come the antelope. Well, uh, the foreman of this ranch, Georgia Dahlman, <laughs> she was uh, uh, looking at the chilies. My brother didn't like her too much. So he stepped behind her while she was bent over looking at the chilies and did this with a fist <laughs> by her butt. So for the radio, he's, uh, he's, yeah, a, he's describing uh, the, the thing that makes the antelope bunt, <laughs> butt ahead. Yeah, so the antelope saw the fist and charged it. Well, when he did, my brother jerked the hand out of the way, and it hit her just like in the movies, hit her right in the butt and knocked her into the chili peppers. Well, my daddy didn't ask where you hurt. He's screaming, oh, oh, my poor chilies, my poor <laughs> well, naturally, we, we had to sleep away from the house that night. We were afraid our daddy might get a little angry. And uh, we had two horned owls that my uh, brother caught, and I raised them. And uh, the horned owls got so big that, again, they were on Ms. Dahlman's arms, and they were, she was trying to feed them, but they were so heavy, her arms started going down. Well, the more her arm went down, the more the owls would climb up <laughs> the, the <laughs> shoulder. And when they got to the top, they got into her hair and started whapping. <laughs> and she was cussing like, take care of this GD, <laughs> this GD bird. And uh, it took a while to disentangle the two of them, the three of them, actually. And, uh, well, that should be in, the, in, in one of your stories somewhere. Well, I've got a thousand stories. Yeah, well, and I, I, got well, a, I don't have a thousand years to write them, but I'm going to get to them. I, you know, I've got a little <laughs> outlines of stories all through my, my house. But I, uh, well, it's interesting that uh, it was advised to don't, don't, don't burn yourself out in writing mm -hmm. because in the early 80s, I made my living. I decided to make my living out of my own creativity and so I would uh, do like wearable art. Yeah. And whenever I first uh, jewelry, and I, I ended up being a fancy ladies hat maker. But in the beginning, whenever I was considering doing this, because I was at a big crossroads in my life, uh, in general, and this was one of the things I decided to do instead of getting a degree in literature, because that was my major in college at Loyola. Uh, at that time, I didn't think that I was a writer, so I didn't know what you could do with a literature degree except go on and teach. And I did not, at that time, think I was teaching material, nor did I think I was corporate material. I'm not the type of person that would fit into a corporation very well. So anyway, I decided to strike out on my own and make my living out of my own creativity. And I quick and and at the time when I was thinking about well you can just you know make stuff all day long and all night, and I realized that creativity comes from a different well in our souls, and it's very limited and you have to protect it. It's it's not a like a bottomless well of energy that you can tap into. So you know you have to actually you have to guard that kind of the door to that creativity in the first place uh, because things can make you not be able to tap into it. That's a wonderful insight. Uh, when I was writing Slow Walk in a Sad Rain about Vietnam, <clears throat> my son said one day, Daddy, <clears throat> I don't want to ride with you anymore. And I said, I don't understand. He said, you've gone through two stop signs and you're not here in the car while you're driving. Mm -hmm. And I realized that until I got that book finished, I didn't need to be endangering other people or myself. I see. I could focus that much and be that out. Of, the characters become more real than the characters I'm meeting out on uh -huh. the road anywhere. 
So it, both in se- uh, slow walk of a sad rain and uh, stepping on over bones, bones, stepping over stepping bones. over bones, both of those characters, the lead characters, get out <laughs> of Vietnam in strange ways. <laughs> Instead of typically yeah. typical um, mustering out of out of country. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, in stepping over bones, uh, it's kind of loosely based on uh, the way I got a. <clears throat> an extra R and R when I was in Vietnam, uh, a sergeant and I got this idea that when people were being loaded onto these medical uh, choppers, our medical C one thirties going to Japan, that no one was questioning them; they were just walking or being loaded on on stretchers. So we wrapped our hands up <laughs> and just walked on with them in, in gauze. And so we went on and had a, a, a little bit of fun uh, in Japan. And uh, I got to thinking about, in my character here, how to introduce the Gullah society and the Gullah culture, which are a group of people, uh, African Americans, who live down in, along the coast in South Carolina, Georgia, to some extent, Florida, and they've kind of filtered over into Mississippi and Louisiana, but the majority of them are there in South Carolina and Georgia. If they're in South Carolina, they're called Gullahs, and if they're in Georgia, they're called Geechees. And the first time I ever heard one of them speak, I fell in love with the language. I, I just didn't know that there was such a beautiful beautiful lilt to the voice it was caribbean but it wasn't it was different and i thought to myself who are these people and then in 1972 after vietnam i'm walking down there with a friend of mine who was a writer over in hendersonville a journalist by the name of steve black and steve was about five foot three and just 90 miles an hour he had that's the only speed he had and he uh We'd hit down around Beaufort and Hunting Island and that area. And uh, he would have to show me all these places that he had read about or discovered. And a lot of it was not on any guide, uh, in any guidebook. It would be like the old stone wall of old Beaufort. Well, we found it behind a Kmart and it was, you know, crumbling down. Or we'd find some uh, Civil War uh, fortresses uh, that were guarding the front of uh, some of the key rivers that uh, fed into Beaufort, the Savannah River and some others. And uh, st- we were walking in uh, over there in Beaufort uh, where uh, it looked like sharecropper houses, but a little bit better, but all of them clean, completely clean. And we found this church and we were walking in front of the church and there was an, uh, a woman of color uh, raking the church. She was, looked like she, even then, she was in her 70s. And she said, and there was a plaque there about a fellow by the name of Robert Smalls. We'd never heard of him. And I was reading the plaque. And she came over and said, uh, you're reading about my relative. You know that. And we said, no, man, we didn't know that. So we read it. Robert Small should have a movie made about him. He should have a biography written of him. I should have done it, but I just, I've just i gotten too old. But this was a man who hated slavery. And he was a slave to one of the finer people in Buford, if you'd call fine people that owned slaves. By fine people, what do you mean? I would say white plantation owners or white landowners. And when I say fine people, their house was fine. Okay. And Robert was a a house slave for them. And when the Civil War began, he was put upon a ship to sail up and down the river that fed out into the uh, bay in Beaufort to deliver supplies for some of the southern troops because they knew that if 
the ship was blown out of the water by the north, uh, you know, who had missed these men? So he got to looking at that and got in a study in, and he said, okay, the next time they leave this ship and we're, we have to load it, tell all your families, and he's talking to other slaves that were on that ship too, tell all your families to come with us. Get them on board, and we're going to go down the river until we find the northern blockade and turn over the ship to them. So when all the white ship personnel left, that's what they did. And they sell that ship to the northern blockade, and he turned the ship over. And the northern naval captain that he turned the ship over to said, you are now captain of this ship, and you'll work for us, not as a slave, but as a free man, and help us conduct these waters to, to carry on our operations. And he did that. When the war was over, they gave Robert Smalls the plantation house where he had been slave. And he moved his family in there, and they stayed there till he died. But the woman who had owned the house, the woman and the man, the man had since died from the war, the woman who had owned the house, who had owned Robert Smalls, she wandered into the house completely mad. And she said, I want to go to my bedroom and I want you to bring me food, Robert. She still thought Robert was a slave. This is the class that individual had. I personally would have thrown her out. He did not. He let her go to the room and he served her meals to her faithfully for the next two years until she passed away. That spoke volumes about class to me. Look here, I'm getting, I'm, I get goosebumps every time I tell that story. He became the first African American to be a congressman and to be a senator at the United States Congress. He was a great man. And not much is known about him except a little, few placards. And I just had to write about those people. A lot of boxers, Leon Spinks, Gullah, Frazier, Gullah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, Joe Frazier. I mean, a lot of people were incredible. And, and someone asked the Gullahs, why do you think you achieved so much? And they said, look, every summer, the whites would leave their plantations to us to be in charge of it. They would come up to Asheville, Hendersonville, and ride out the hot summer and the mosquitoes and all that stuff up here. We would run things, and we learned how to run things. And not only did we learn how to run things, but we did it better. And we loved the heat. The mosquitoes wouldn't hurt us because we had our own doctors, and that's what Alma, in my story, she is a hoodoo doctor. And hoodoo is voodoo with Christianity. Uh -huh. And so when you see uh, all these potions in some of the Charleston shops and stuff, those are from people like her. But what they had was an ability to prevent malaria even then. They were not allowed to go into white hospitals, so they had to develop their own medicine. They were the ones that knew how to strip bark to make a form of aspirin. Mm -hmm. They knew all the sort of stuff. They weren't allowed to have baskets, so they made their own out of sweet grass. And it became a, just like the Cherokees up here, it became a form of art form. Of course, I can talk forever, but one of the things I want everybody to remember, the word Seminole, means fugitive. It's a name that was given them by the Spanish. The Gullahs wanted to fight against slavery and were willing to sacrifice themselves to do so. And they did not go north to escape. Some may have, 
But the men and some women went south into the Everglades. Yeah, that's one of the things I learned from reading the book. I wasn't aware that they also headed south. Yeah. Because mostly you hear about north. them heading north. Uh, uh, they went south. And, and and for those in the listening audience who don't know, the Seminoles were never defeated. Never, ever. And, and it's partly because they would go into the, especially the Everglade swamps, and my understanding is there are play there, ten or fifteen miles into the Everglades, are places that no white man has ever seen, and never will, and never will, and they could so they could retreat into that area, and they could not be defeated. Andrew Jackson tried to defeat them three times, and all three times Andrew Jackson came out of that those Everglades basically uh, with his tail between his legs. Well, and, and you being a hobby gambler <laughs> should appreciate the fact that the Seminoles have casinos oh. all <laughs> over Florida. Now, I call it the uh, Indian Revenge. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, but like Hard Rock Cafe or the Hard, Hard yes, Rock. Uh, all of them. All of those are, I think, they're owned by the Seminoles. Yes, they are. And Cherokee, of course, uh, I, there's a statue out in front of Cherokee that they call the Corn Maiden. Uh-huh. I call her the Coin Maiden. She takes all of our coins. <laughs> coin Maiden. <laughs> but I think of that economic engine that they were smart enough. Oh, the other thing about the Seminoles, I did not know until I researched and did this this book, they were put upon the Trail of Tears along with the other Cherokees. Mm-hmm. And they were the, they called them the black Cherokees. They weren't. They were the Seminoles. But they walked with them all the way to Oklahoma. But tribal prejudice was against them there because of their skin. And so Gatto, G-A-T-O, Gatto Jr., who was a famous son of a famous warrior of the Seminoles, led his group out of, out of Oklahoma. Now think about this. All the way across Texas, deep into Mexico, and he fought the Apaches, he fought the Cherokees, uh, not Cherokees, uh, he fought the Cherokees getting out, he the fought Creeks. the Comanches, the Creeks, the Apaches, and then when they got down into um, Mexico, uh, they fought all the Indian tribes that attacked them so courageously. The Mexican government <laughs> gave them more arms and gave them villages and said, you may live here forever. And so today, even today, there are Mexican villages down in Mexico that are completely black of these survivors and uh, progeny uh, of these former slaves who fought all the way across America, took a left turn, went down through Texas, and found a home. Wow. That's something. That's wonderful. That's an interesting sideline from from uh, Stepping Over Bones. Yes, ma'am. And the name Stepping Over Bones comes from something Alleman tells him, and it's something I had read, and I couldn't remember where I'd read it, so I just paraphrased it and had her out of her mouth, which is that there is a place in Africa where all the elephants go to die. And when they go to there, they come upon the bones of all their ancestors. And carefully they step over those bones until they get to their dying spot just beyond where the last elephant had died. And there they sink to their knees and they die knowing that they have furthered their tribe. And I never forgot that because... Our job is to drag drag the human being further out of the muck and the mud we were born in to drag us up to a higher place. And that's what all my writing is trying to do is to get us to understand that there's a higher power we need to strive for. There are going to be setbacks like these AR-15s killing all these people by poor mentally ill idiots but by the same token 
we have to understand that we're moving towards a better place. Otherwise, why move at all? We must strive to be better as human beings. Well, that kind of touches on my uh, understanding of music, drama, mm -hmm. books, art. Yeah. Art and culture unite. And um, your books obviously take us into places that we don't have any exposure to any other way and certainly enhances a much deeper understanding of cultures that are foreign to us. And um, I couldn't agree with you more that, you know, we've got to, we've got to try being better than we are. Fiction. It's Lovely. not good. It's not good for people to stay stagnant. You need to <laughs> no. be growing. It's good to be growing. Otherwise, why are you here? Yeah, I'm 75 almost, and you got to keep growing. Yes, uh, Dwayne. Uh, one of the things about uh, fiction is that it's truth and a half. I've always remembered that it is truth and a half. The good fiction, when you read something and you're moved by it, it's true in your soul, but it's a little beyond that because it moves us emotionally, mentally forward. At least that's my take on it. Well, you know, and I mentioned earlier that I was a literature major. Yeah. I had, the uh, at that time in my life, my whole growing up years, I always read because that was the only place I found what felt like tr any kind of truth. That's so true. Uh, it's um, Even yeah. in the fiction stuff that I read, it touched on, I don't know, as a little kid, I could, I guess I had a bull, a bull, you know what, meter back then. <laughs> You're born with it. <laughs> so I had this meter and, and I saw a lot of that around me. Yep. But in, in the books that I read, I didn't see it. I didn't see that level of horse manure. <laughs> so, so, and that's why whenever I was going to college, I tended towards literature because at that time in my life, I was still very hungry for truth. And that is a safe way to find it. Yeah. It is a safe way to find it. I've, there's rarely been... Uh, because if you... If you actually speak the truth out in the world, some people might not speak to you anymore. <laughs> it's Devane, you know, you're right. And yes. it's I, one of the greatest movies in my life that I've, there's only been one movie, I would say, maybe two, that I wish I had written that should have been my book, all right? The first is Legends of the Fall. And uh, it is so sad and so wonderful and so rich and so tragic. And uh, the Indian who is the narrator, he said, uh, Tristan was a rock against all people that all people broke against. And he was the tragic hero. Brad Pitt plays him. And I remember there's two young ladies that have a podcast that watch movies and they come for the first time and they comment on, on what they're seeing and everything. And one of them, they were both bub <laughs> they were both bawling their eyes out at the end of the movie. And she says, I'll never watch that again. It's so sad. Well, life is sad. Gosh, dog it. It's great. It's, it's, it's rich. That's the way to look at life. It's rich. Um, uh, right now, uh, you know, I'm 75, and I'm seeing that uh, my body is deteriorating, but I'm training right now for a powerlifting contest for ages 75 to 79 nationally that I've hired a coach that is uh, working with me, and uh, so I'm doing it safely. I've been powerlifting all my life, or mostly, and... Uh, uh, Back in 2011, I was number two in the nation, but now um, I bowed out due to 
some injuries and my losing a toe. So now I'm doing it again because I'm at the last segment for lifting, 75 to 79, that there is contest for. And I'm at the age group where I want to be at my weight class, which is substantially less than what it was when I was a young man. And when I say young, in my 60s. And uh, Rollo May, who was a psychiatrist back in the 70s, mm -hmm. he once said, you got to do something that you got no explanation for why you do it. He said, it's healthy. I don't know why I like to lift heavy weights. I've never figured that out. But I like to see what my human body can do. And the more safe you are, the better off you are. But I, it's like Harrison Ford flying a plane. I don't know why he does it. He doesn't know why, but he enjoys it. And when I'm lifting and I see other people saying he shouldn't be able to do that, I feel good about myself. How, how high can you go when you're lifting? Well, right now, just, uh, just on my, uh, uh, there's three lifts. There's uh, squats, bench press, and deadlift. Uh, my deadlift right now is 360. Wow. Okay. My bench press is right at 225. And my squat, which is my nemesis, is right at, well, I'm going to say 175 for sure, but I'm shooting for 225. But once between 175 and 200, I know I can do. Well, what a wonderful conversation we've had. <laughs> How can people follow you? How can they see uh, how can they get a hold of your many books that you've written? Okay. Tell the people how they, how, how they can get in touch with you. Thank you. I, I'm not a good, I just, I like writing. Uh, all my books, except for Stepping Over Bones, because it has not been published yet, but all my books are on Amazon.com, uh, and it's also in Kindle on Amazon. So feel free to go on there and get, get some of those uh, uh, you know, a writer doesn't make much from the sale of his books. If the books sell to you, say, for $10, $15, he makes about a dollar fifty to two fifty. It doesn't make much. Uh, now, because my agent has died, probably she died of starvation because I'm such a slow writer. Uh, because my agent has died, I uh, was going through the process of finding a new agent and it's almost, it's almost like they're all gatekeepers and uh, protecting something. I don't know what it is they're protecting. They don't want the complete manuscript to judge it. They want you to put samples. Well, in my opinion, you need to have the complete book to see it. And if you don't like it, that's fine. That's, that's business. But uh, in Stepping Over Bones, I decided to give that away for free to anybody that wants it, and my email is all small letters, P-A-P-A -P -A doc, Papa Doc, 47, at AOL dot com. Feel free to send me your email, and I'll send this book to you for free. The words getting out there for the gullers and for their culture is more important to me than making any money at all. And I promise you the book is not a slog. You will enjoy reading it. 